Hi everyone, I am Gary Knoll and this is the Progressive Commentary Hour. Today's theme is appreciating those individuals throughout our history who struggled, suffered, many died, so that we could have the freedoms we have today. There are times when we think that any of the protests that we see originated spontaneously today. No, there have been protests in American history for hundreds of years. Our program today focuses upon one. It is based upon a documentary called Dawn of Day. It's a historical documentary about the Underground Railroad in Kansas that brings to light a county's unsung heroes who traversed one of the most turbulent times in our nation's history. Faith, family, and politics united a community of neighbors who lived and died to ensure Kansas was a free state. Richard Pitts, director of the Wonder Workshop in Manhattan, narrates the film and interviews educators and historians and descendants of the abolitionists who shared heritage and their lives in the freedom that they enjoyed and what they had to do to fight for that freedom, how they helped other people with the underground railroads that were occurring. I just feel this is important because so often today people have no real sense of the context of history and how many of the freedoms they take for granted or have to reinforce today what it was like when people did not have those freedoms. And who were they? I believe that these are the unsung heroes. Now to this special documentary. It's a story that can't be forgotten because there's so much injustice. There's so much hatred. And it's something that we can't ever allow to happen again in our country and in the greater sense in the whole world. The best way that we can fight ignorance is to educate. And so kids need to know this story about human injustice, about doing what is right, about going and believing in something to the point where you take action on it. Every day across the United States, school children recite the Pledge of Allegiance. The last sentence states, with liberty and justice for all. That liberty and justice came at a price. In America, between 1607 and 1865, African Americans didn't have their freedom. During this time period, they fought to be free. However, their story has often been excluded from the American experience. Why? Because most of their stories come from the oral tradition. And until the Civil Rights era, their story wasn't considered important. African Americans, Native Americans, and Euro Americans worked together here in Kansas between 1854 and 1861 to make Kansas a free state. They established the western edge of the Underground Railroad in this country, which started the long journey to liberty and justice for all. Just north of the town of Obansi stands a marker in honor of the diverse, brave men and women who traveled to that area. The sign reads, an Astra per Aspira, which means, a rough road leads to the stars. That monument has more meaning than most people know. The journey to freedom was unlike the highway tolls that you and I pay today. Braving the Underground Railroad guaranteed exhaustion mental, physical, and psychological. Thousands tried to pay the toll for freedom. Only a few made it, and the ones that didn't were sent back to the farms they tried to escape from. It is estimated that between 20,000 and 30,000 slaves were held along the western border of Missouri, with over 115,000 statewide. Although most slaveholders have fewer than 10 slaves, the work that was required of them was every bit as grueling 
as those on larger plantations in the South. Still, due to their smaller size, it gave opportunity for slaves to look beyond their master's farms and to establish connections on other farms that would enable some of them to escape. In researching the history of the Underground Railroad throughout the United States, many of the stories we hear about describe individuals and families leading small parties of slaves from one way station to the next, acting as conductors and of individual station masters, those that provided safe houses where slaves could stay for a short time. In nearly all cases, they were headed north to the free states with routes leading as far north as Canada. Somewhat unique to Kansas is the recorded story about organized trains that transported larger groups of slaves from one location for many miles, usually to a safe house before making their homework journey. After these trains had been established, it gave room for station masters to do short runs from one house to another, with rest stations in between. In 1860, Charles Leon Hart a Polish-American and committed abolitionist journeyed with a group of like-minded men and approximately 15 slaves on one of the last trains of the Underground Railroad in Kansas. Reverend John Stewart was their appointed leader. They traveled an incredible distance of approximately 300 miles from Lawrence, Kansas to Iowa City, Iowa. They traveled a rough, northwesterly route to avoid the more popular lane trail that was being watched by slave catchers and pro-slavery sympathizers. Traveling in a train of four to five horse-drawn wagons, they transported men, women, children, and infants. The road was not easy and often meant staying only a day or two ahead of masters and slave catchers. There were close calls and heated warnings from friends along the way. Charles recorded their two-month journey from Lawrence southwest through the Wakarusa Range to Auburn, Harveyville, Wabunsee, across the Kaw River, north of Manhattan, Centralia, on up into Nebraska, east of the Missouri River, to their eventual destination in Iowa City. In what is one of the most detailed accounts on record, they not only escaped slave catchers and pro-slavery sympathizers, but they trailblazed the furthest western loop of the Underground Railroad at the time. Charles recorded the names of some individuals, including descriptions of them in a few of their conversations. Names like Black Hawk, Black Jack, Nancy, Kate, My George, Johnny, Joe, and Ned. Food was always scarce, and fresh clothes and bedding were much appreciated. Help that came was not always from the source one would expect. Several different religious denominations and fellowships were organized to come to their aid, often providing news of followers that were all too eager to catch up with them. It becomes clear, reading Leon Hart's journal, that there was a wide variety of opinions and positions that people had about slavery. Yet through it all, people of all faiths and political backgrounds united to make their passageway safe. Once they arrived to Iowa City, some of the freed slaves settled. Others were transported further north or back east to Boston. It's interesting to note that many of these freedmen were willing to go to war and join the Union Army in the years to come. In order for the Underground Railroad to be successful, you had to rely on way stations and relations of old friends to make it from point to point. In order to understand the Underground Railroad in Kansas prior to 1861, it's important to know who some of those key players were and their perspectives. Well, the, the first group that we need to think, of, of course, the abolitionists, the people that came to Kansas with the express purpose of stopping the spread of slavery. 
And we're talking about people from the New England states, um, usually driven here on a religious basis. You have John Brown, who is from back east. He is inspired by, you don't want to call it fanaticism, but it's religious zeal. And he's going to come to Kansas and he's going to do everything that he can with he and his sons to eliminate the scourge of slavery from the Great Plains. He kind of matched the, the, the pace and tempo and, and the fever of the Missouri ruffians? Oh, absolutely, if not exceeding it. I mean, and he's memorialized there in the Capitol, John Stuart Curry's great mural of him holding the rifle in one hand, the Bible in the other, and those piercing eyes. I mean, it's just amazing to look at this character in history. They want to stop slavery. Kansas is the hotbed for it. It's going to be up for popular sovereignty. We got border ruffians, mm -hmm. people that cross the border from Missouri. They're going to vote several times or try to vote several times when the elections come up. And, you know, one of the other things they try and do is intimidate people, make sure they don't vote because they see Kansas as an agricultural hotbed. Mm. It's a place where slavery can expand. Yeah. You got border ruffians like William Quantrill, who leads the raid into Lawrence. Today, we'd call it a terrorist attack. Massacre. I mean, they go in, they murder males randomly in the streets, and it, it depicts a time that's just hard for us to fathom today. Well, tell me a little bit about the two major compromises and how that affected Kansans, Kansans at that particular time in the 1850s before it was a state. Well, you, you know, I think back to Shelby Foote, uh -huh. who was one of the best Civil War narrative writers of all time. And, and he said, you know, the one thing about Americans is we tend to think of ourselves as uncompromising. Yeah. And yet it's these two compromises, the Compromise of 1820, the Compromise of 1850 that really set the stage for what becomes Bleeding Kansas. So talk to me a little bit about this term that we hear called Bleeding Kansas. Bleeding Kansas is a term that Horace Greeley used. He was the editor of the New York Times at the time, and he was also a fervent abolitionist. And it's a time where media sensationalism exists. It's also a time where editors like Horace Greeley impact the country. Mm -hmm. uh, later we have the headline on the New York Tribune, Head West, young man. I mean, Greeley was this influential literary figure. He speaks out about slavery and he sees bleeding Kansas as a insightful term, a way to ignite the passions of the people of the country. Greeley saw this as an opportunity to use that as a bit of propaganda to promote what's happening in Kansas as kind of a microcosm of the whole country and the fact that it's going to bring about the Civil War or at least the abolition of slavery, which was his goal. The South, they want to keep the balance in the Senate uh -huh. and they need to have some sort of concession to make the Compromise of 1850 work. So they allow slave trade to occur in certain parts, uh, still allowed in the capital. Politically speaking, the Compromise of 1850 is doomed to fail. Yeah. And that's where we get the Kansas-Nebraska Act. The Kansas-Nebraska Act allows popular sovereignty to determine yeah. what's going to happen in the new territories coming out. And so you have this political battlefield that's going to be Kansas. Mm -hmm. Will it be a free state? Will it be a slave state? That's where you have the people from New England coming in. You have the border ruffians coming across from Missouri to try and make Kansas a slave state. And it essentially is the first piece of tinder to ignite the powder keg that will be the Civil War. Amongst all this turmoil here in Kansas, yet and still, African Americans sought to come here to escape, why? You got the Fugitive Slave Act that's enacted and, and it's literally a felony to aid and abet a slave yeah. or to even house a, a slave in the North. 
and so while there's still traffic on the Underground Railroad heading up through the north and the eastern states, Kansas becomes kind of a desirable route. This spur that can circumvent some of the hot spots where there are raiding parties waiting for slaves to come north. And so Kansas becomes uh, the spur of the railroad as a way to try and get slaves to the freedom of the north and Canada. Talk to me from a teacher's perspective. Why should kids want to know about the, this history in Kansas? It's kind of funny. Clear up to the 1940s, 1950s, Kansas is a political hotbed. The acts of William Allen White as a newspaper editor was big. Dwight D. Eisenhower comes from here. He's the president in the 1950s. And Kansas was a good barometer of what was occurring in, in the state. You ask kids today, is, is Kansas important? Well, we're just a bunch of farmers. No, I mean, there, there was so much history to it yeah. and such powerful stories. And you catch that in a story about what is right, what is justice, what does this country mean? And it's a powerful story. There's heroes, there's villains and it can just draw you in. But you know, the biggest thing, it starts the Civil War. And it's really what makes the United States, the United States. Prior to the Civil War, if you ask someone from Richmond, Virginia, who are you? Well, I'm a Virginian. It's after the Civil War that that same person would say, well, I'm an American. Here in Kansas is the start of the modern United States, in my opinion. Whoa. <laughs> I can picture a, a room full of people dancing. I know. I think that too. Yeah. Long dresses and yep. yeah. And I hear that you have a connection to the Underground Railroad here in Kansas. I do. My great great grandfather was a station master. On the Underground Railroad, my great-grandfather was a conductor. Joshua Smith was the, uh, the older man, and John was his son. Joshua and his wife and a baby came from England. And they went to Utica, New York, then Lawrence, and then came out looking for land and found land just west of the... Uh, Indian reservation, which was huge in those days. And what was his motivation to come? He was looking for land. He was an orchardist in England. Oh. And he was looking for land and found it and then went back and got his family. And, and then he was here probably a year or so before the colony came from New Haven. And then he got very involved, obviously, in the sure. Underground Railroad. Why do you think they called it the Underground Railroad? You know, I have heard, and a, a story that somebody said is probably true, but I don't know that, that a master was chasing his slave, and he said he just disappeared. It was like he went underground. <laughs> I know that was at times, places, sure. but, um, and then uh, since they called it the Underground Railroad, then they used railroad terms for station master and conductor and such. So tell me what a station master and conductor of the Underground Railroad is. Station master housed the slaves, and conductor obviously conducted them to a safe place. However, I found out that my great-great-grandfather conducted them clear to Nebraska. Okay. It was very secretive, it had to be, of course, and my grandfather told the story, his dad had told him, that they would come in the middle of the night with the wagon, and they just said, let's go and the, the kids didn't know anything about it. They couldn't have. You know, if any of the children had known about sure. what was going on and had mentioned it to a friend, absolutely, they would have all been in trouble, so. So, do you have any idea where they hid the uh, 
fugitives? In the loft of the house. And Joshua's house was right across the road and down about a block from the Mitchell house. And they were very good friends. Do you think there were ever any close calls? Oh, I'm sure there were. I'm sure there were. I have one of the things that my aunt wrote down was that one of my great, great aunts, someone came to the house and said there are catchers or something. The, the people who were chasing the slaves in the area and to be very careful. And she said, I have a um, big bucket of hot water on the stove to throw on them. <laughs> so they, they must have known. Sure. But uh, that would have, she would have been an adult by that time. What do you think would have happened if your great-great-grandfather had gotten caught? Well, he went back to Lawrence to get his family mm -hmm. and was accosted on the way back by border ruffians. And he said that he thought the only thing that saved his life was his prematurely gray hair and his English accent. He convinced them he didn't know anything about it. <laughs> but if they'd have thought he had anything to do with it, they would have hugged him on the spot. Oh, I believe it too. And that's why I was so amazed when I found out that he took slaves with a wagon mm -hmm. to the Nebraska line. And I think, boy, that man had to be very brave and very committed. What do you think was one of the determining factors that pushed him to the anti-slavery side? I'd like to think that he thought it was just a very important thing to do. And I think I'd probably be right because of what he did. Mm -hmm. He must have thought it was, it was the right thing to do. During the 1850s, Kansas was a territory governed by local law enforcement and militias. During that time, emphasis was made on the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, virtually making it impossible for anyone to remain neutral. So this was built uh, sometime after the Civil War when the economy recovered. You know, there was the big drought of 1860, so nothing happened then. And this, this door used to open inward but it's a great old building. Share with me a little bit about the role the Wabunsee Colony um, played with the Underground Railroad here in Kansas. The Beecher Colony came in 1856 in the spring. And before they came out here, they were greeted in Lawrence by the Free State leaders. And they pledged their allegiance that if Lawrence ever needed them to come, they would come and help. So when they got here, it was just a matter of weeks before they were called and they formed a militia called the Prairie Guards. And the people in the Prairie Guards were very knowledgeable of each other. And the Underground Railroad started a year later when the families, the women and children had come by 1857 because the violence had subsided along the Kansas River. And since they had formed all these alliances during the height of the clashes. Then when it came time to help enslaved Africans seeking their freedom, everybody knew each other already. So somebody in Harveyville would help someone coming from up the Wakarusa, and then they'd go from Harveyville to straight here sometimes, sometimes through Mission Creek. But all the people helping knew each other. Oftentimes, some of the kids uh, didn't know what the parents were doing as far as their Underground Railroad uh, endeavors. Uh, do you think that was the case with Captain Mitchell and some of the other folks that you just recently m mentioned? It's very interesting that you bring that up. Um, one, uh, I think one of the Smith children later in their memoir said, Mom was making so much food and we didn't know where it was going. <laughs> we weren't eating it. Yeah. In the case of the Mitchells, Captain Mitchell didn't actually marry until well after the Civil War. He was living here with his sister, Agnes. And so Agnes was the one that was cooking and caring for these freedom seekers. And it was she who mostly told the stories to the Mitchell children. Uh -huh. Because Captain Mitchell had also been to 
the California gold rush and the Australian gold rush, and he thought those stories were much more interesting yeah, yeah, than absolutely. the bleeding Kansas stories. Oh. So as far as I have found, the Mitchell children mostly got their stories from their aunt. Okay. Were there any legacies that they, they uh, inherited and acted out on? Yes, actually. There were four Mitchell children, and the ranch was actually called the Big Four Ranch because they were all so tall. Well, the eldest brother and the youngest brother worked for Hornaday when he founded the New York Zoological Society. It's now called the Bronx Zoo. Wow. And H.R., the eldest, he was a major, he was like the CEO of the place. Okay. And so what I'm getting at is they were very educated, and Maud, the only girl in the family, she was an accomplished artist. She had studied in New York, and she felt it was her role to preserve these stories. She helped get all the story put in the 1930s WPA uh, tourist guide that were published. She helped do the groundwork to get the Beecher Church put on the National Register. That's awesome. Now, we know that Captain Mitchell could have done many other things. But why do you think he took a stand and, and put his life in jeopardy and his sister's life in jeopardy? Well, this is very interesting. In my research, I've found that a lot of these families were radicalized during the Amistad trial in Connecticut in the late 1830s. And we know that Captain Mitchell's father, William Mitchell Sr., was one of the founding members of an anti-slavery society in Middleton, Connecticut. You know, the, the people, during the Amistad trial, it, it was all in the news, and the people right. would come and, and observe the trial. And the former president of the United States was one of the attorneys. It was big news back then. And there was a lot of sympathy for these Africans who wanted to go back to Africa. So I think that's where it came from. And then this opportunity sure, to sure. act on those ideals came up. So he jumped at it and, and uh, he had all these leadership skills from having been through those experiences. Can you imagine coming here in 1856 when as far as you could see, it was just tall grass prairie? There were no trees here, even along Antelope Creek here. And that's where they had to go to harvest logs to build the original log cabin, which is now encased in the rest of the house. When it was first built, it was just a log cabin, about 16 by 12, something like that, yeah. with an upper loft. And then when Mitchell got married, they jacked the house up and dug out a basement and made a stone foundation. And then I think also at that time they added this portion here. Okay. And the front door used to be right here where this window is. And we're really lucky. Kate Buster, who is the great-great-granddaughter, she has authenticated and documented every change That's to awesome. the house. It was in the Mitchell family all the way up until the 70s when the Chryslers bought it. And the fugitive slaves would have been... Hidden in that loft area up there that's now yeah. the window. That was made into Maud studio in the 1930s, I think, somewhere okay. around there. So the original loft isn't there anymore. And what is so fascinating, the Chryslers have enabled anybody to come by and look through the window right. and see the original logs of the original cabin. I bet there's more out here that people don't know about. I think you may be right. Yeah. You know, we're so fortunate to have the Chryslers living here because they've really embraced the history. I get inspired every time I come here gives me a chance to not think about what I have to do tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I'm in the moment. What about you? Oh, I get caught up in all the day-to-day -day activities, but when I have a chance to reflect, yes. I feel like somebody's looking over my shoulder. Huh. 
Yeah, me too. Here's their little shrine to the Elvis. pioneers. And here we have Maud Mitchell. Mm -hmm. And in this photo, they're holding an original Beecher Bible, which is the Sharps rifle. And then in this photo, she is holding an original Beecher Bible. It's stamped by Henry Ward Beecher's okay. congregation. Then we have Ethel here. Ethel Morgan, and this little plaque is in, in her memory. She was so beloved. I think this was done in 1907 for the 50th anniversary of the church. And uh, Maud, Captain Mitchell's daughter, was the artist. The great artist. Of course, here we have the bell. You want to ring the bell? No, you ring it. The, the don't, think don't, that, don't go up with it now. They'll think there's a fire or something. <laughs> The kids love to oh, come do this. That. I think the town is used to it. They, oh, there's a tour in town. Yeah. Why do you think they chose Wabunsi? Why not stay in Lawrence or Topeka? We're very fortunate to have the company minutes uh -huh. from the time they left New Haven, Connecticut until they formed the Wabunsi Town Company. So we know very specifically that they wanted their own place. They didn't want to combine with anybody else. And you had the Potawatomi Reservation mm -hmm. that extended all the way from Topeka to the edge of Mount Mitchell over here. So that land was off limits for settlement. They wanted to be near the river. They were thinking of the future economy of the town. They wanted a river because at that time there was steamboat traffic. Yeah. Well, you know what's strange to me is that a lot of, like looking at Manhattan, and Manhattan is named for a town back east, Manhattan, New York. And why do you think they didn't name this New Haven after the place where they came from or some other town in Connecticut? That's a good question. And again, going back to the minutes, there, there were a lot of lively discussions about this. They did want to name it. Name it. Some of them wanted to name it New Haven, and there were some heated arguments about it. But Charles Lines, who was the elected leader of the colony, I think he was on business in Lawrence, and there was an old Indian agent that had been around since the late 1830s. And he asked him what would be a good name. And he suggested Wabansa, or Wabansi. Mm -hmm. And uh, meaning, and at the time, interpreting it to mean dawn of day. Sure. And there's, if you get into that, it's much more nuanced than dawn of day. But that's what the white people thought it meant. And since they had come from the east and were starting new lives, they thought it was perfect. Sure. Well, this Underground Railroad story is fascinating for so many people. And being able to walk in the footsteps of these folks is amazing to me. I know that there were diverse people involved in the Underground Railroad and in this community. Who are some of the unsung heroes that we haven't heard about? Since it was an illegal activity, uh, people at the time didn't really talk about That's it right. that much, even in, in, among the families. But there was a great wave of nostalgia and, and reflection that started in the 1870s. It really culminated in 1879 at a massive old settlers meeting in Lawrence. And all these subjects came up. We know that Captain Mitchell, since his children perpetuated the stories, we know about them. But then we have people like the, the Platt brothers. Their father was Jura Platt, who was quite well known as an Underground Railroad station master in Minden, Illinois. They were here, and we have a photograph that a black woman had made it to Canada and apparently gotten married, and she sent a photograph back to the Platts. And when their descendants gave these objects to the Kansas State Historical Society, this photograph was among those pictures. And from the family stories, she was one of the people that the Platt brothers helped. Then you have somebody like Sam Weed, who was kind of the uncle figure of everybody, and, and was known to uh, 
imbibe <laughs> occasionally. <laughs> We know that he helped because in one of the few documented trains that came through, they talk about him getting a plow to help them cut down the bank at the river so they could cross the river. Then there's mention that the Lines family, Charles Lines and his family, had fugitive slaves staying with him. The Kelsey family is mentioned. And uh, who knows, with the internet and sure. family diaries, sure. uh, uh, appearing, maybe we'll learn more in the future. So for kids nowadays, what, what, what do you think they can take away from this story? Richard Cordley, this minister who was associated with this church, he wrote about when the settlers first came, they were so concerned with their personal safety that everybody came together to fight a common cause. and all petty differences were dropped. They came together as Americans yes. Yes. to, in their minds, they were fulfilling what the Founding Fathers had said was the promise of, of this country. That's right. And they felt very tied to, to that revolutionary spirit. This church is a manifestation of that time and that feeling. I think we're at another point where we need to come together in Americans and face this unfinished business. I agree. You know, we still haven't really dealt with race, yeah. and, and a lot of people are trying to sweep it under the rug. Yeah. And I have the hope that uh, we will finally, you know, face it and deal with it. If we don't give our kids the kind of examples that, they, that will bring people together, as opposed to the ones that separate us, then we'll never come together as Americans. And I think the history has, a, has the job of telling us what we've done together. Exactly. It's hard to imagine what it must have been like for fugitive slaves, making the long journey from southern states up to the free states and even north to Canada. Even with the help, the persecution they suffered, the hunger, the fatigue, and the ever-present fear of being caught and separated from your family was terrifying. In Leon Hart's journal, we have a few glimpses of what it was really like. I was raised in Cumberland County, North Carolina. When old Massa Burgess died, we all fell to different masses. Don't know to this day where my folks are gone. A few weeks ago, my Massa went to Pikes Peak and took me along. Made up my mind at the start that I'd go to the mountains and slip away from Massa. Some nights ago, I don't know how many, Massa and other white trash had been playing cards and drinking whiskey in camp. And all got terrible drunk. In the morning, found all the white folks that left us. When Master got awfully mad at something I'd done or not done, don't know exactly which, he tries to give me a sound whipping. But I would not. I told him right to his face, he better look out. I won't arrest me a while till the war's over anyhow. And if white folks should come after me, well, I mean to fight with them. I'm a free man now. Black John, 1860. The story of the last train demonstrated the need for alternative pathways north. Once an established route like the Lane Trail became well known, it became harder to avoid slave hunters and the law that would have been on the side of slave owners during the territorial period. You have to remember that abolitionists were considered the extremists to many Americans at that time. But the people of Wabunsi saw things differently and helped not only Leon Hart's group, but others before and after the last train passed through. What is often missed in the story of slavery in America is that these were refugees, people stolen from their homeland and sold into slavery 
and not just by white men. They were treated more as cattle and property rather than as human beings, and yet they persevered. So often we drive past places we think we know and don't stop to think what really went on here. In 1985, I first came to Manhattan, Kansas as a student and was introduced to some of the stories about the Underground Railroad. As I began teaching and working with kids, I've tried to share my love of history with them. To me, history is a current event. Whatever came before us acts upon our lives today. I think examples are the key to anyone's success in growing up. And my mother gave me the best examples I could possibly ever had, which caused me to survive difficult times. And it was this relationship that she had with a diversity of people in our community that let me know that there was another side to the story other than the ones that I heard at school. I was born and raised in Pleasantville, New Jersey. And we have a boardwalk in the town right next door to us, Atlantic City. And we would go to the boardwalk and go swimming, or we would go to the boardwalk. They had three piers, a Million Dollar Pier, Steeplechase Pier, and the Steel Pier. Well, on the Steel Pier, they had a show where this high diving horse would do this fantastic feat and go up this ramp and dive off into this pool. It was an amazing experience for a young man like myself. And as we left there, we decided to go to the Wax Museum. And inside this wax museum, we saw kings, queens, um, Hollywood movie stars. It was fascinating because I had never experienced a piece of wax to look like that. And at the very end, something happened. My mom always told us that there's, there's two types of alarm clocks. There's an alarm clock when you need to be on time for school or whatever. And then there's an alarm clock when something special happens, a graduation or birth of a baby. And my alarm clock went off because there was a diorama that pictured a, an African family and they were in loincloth and they had bones in their nose and plates in their lips. And then there was this sign and the sign said, savages. As a youth, I said, these folks look like me. And I, I had a curiosity to know if that was true. Well, my sister couldn't answer it, but my mother did. And she told me that it is true that there are folks in Africa that decorate themselves accordingly. But the reality is not all African people look like that. And in America, she said, not all Americans look the same. Everybody has their own uh, uh, way of dressing and, and beautifying themselves. She said, but the sign, that was a, a, a person's or that museum's way of displaying uh, racial superiority. You have come from more than just slavery, she told me. And it's up to you to figure out your journey. And so from that point on, I, I really wanted to know, did we do anything besides being slaves? And if so, what did we do? And it's an important question to ask today. And that's because African Americans and people in general do not know their own history. Not too far from the town of Wabunsi is the remains of one of the Platt brothers' homesteads, Enoch, Luther, and Jeremiah, settled in this area shortly after the New Haven colony arrived. As young men in Illinois, they experienced the struggle of abolitionists by helping their parents hide and transport runaway slaves to the north. Hearing the call for the Free State Movement, they came down to the Kansas Territory to help in the cause. They were farmers, 
builders, and preachers. Two of them went on to teach at universities here in Kansas, and one eventually helped start a school for freedmen after the Civil War. Not much is known about the slaves they helped here in Wabansi, but we do have clues. Years after the Civil War, the Platts received a few photographs from former slaves, men and women, who we assume they helped along their path north. Looking at these faces with no names, we can only wonder what they experienced and with what gratitude they felt when they finally had their freedom. Perhaps someday we will learn their names, where they lived, and what became of their families. It is estimated that as many as 35 abolitionists are buried in the Wabansi Cemetery. It's hard not to feel a closeness to the people who lived and died in this small community. Their lives are sacrifice. Their struggle to do the right thing inspire us to keep up the cause and to make things better for the next generation. But it was not just abolitionists who did a great work here. The generations that would follow after them helped build a community where travelers of freed men and women felt safe. Many go unnamed, and many are yet to be discovered. But their lives will carry on. If we pass on their stories, if we make their lives of sacrifice known, To collect all these stories and provide that narrative of what the Underground Railroad is about, that's something that needs to be done. And, and so that we can honor those people that did this great work, this right thing. If they could do it 160 years ago, why not do it today? And, and that's a, a great benefit of this story. The fact that it shows that as human beings, we're capable of doing the right thing. It means a lot to me to know that, that my family was so involved and so dedicated to this. I ask children when they come in, do you know about the Underground Railroad? And I'm finding that most cases in about the third grade during Black History Month, they learn about the Underground Railroad. And a lot of children are very interested in what I have there. But I think it's something that children should be taught. What legacy do you think Captain Mitchell left behind for, for us? Do the right thing. Follow you know, the humanity that your ancestors have passed down to you. And, you know, in his case, he was a Christian and followed the precepts of Christianity to you know, do unto others as they would do unto sure. you. And, he heard all that as a young child in Middletown, Connecticut. How do you see him within yourself? Well, you know, I thought about that. And I must confess, I'm, in my whole involvement with the Mitchells, I'm, I have been more inspired by Maud, I guess, because she's more recent. She never married, and she devoted her life to preserving the stories of the pioneers. It's her desire, her passion uh -huh. to, to keep those stories of the pioneers alive. That's really what's inspired me. But of course, Captain Mitchell and Sister Agnes, 
they were the source of inspiration for Maud. Sure. So it's in a way it just kind of passes down. I think one of the things that inspires me about all of these folks, Captain Mitchell being the leader, is the fact that sometimes you have to take a stand. Yeah. Like you said earlier, and not always is it going to be popular. It means that you're probably going to alienate some folks, but you know in your heart when something is right and when something is wrong. I see that part of the legacy of all of these people has played out in my own life in a number of different ways. That's what history does for us. It allows us to see that people have done remarkable things, not without big armies, but you know, sometimes with just a few, that escalates. But somebody has to start it. We will have more documentaries like this. We will be having a series of the 10 of the most important African Americans in American history, what each one represented, and what freedoms of insight to our mind and to our body politic they brought. And then we're going to have a series also of Latino Americans, Native Americans. So we're going to have, over the next 12 months, a lot of programs that we wouldn't otherwise normally hear but we need to. Thank you all for listening, and have a nice day. Hey, what's up, man? Hey, brother, what's up? This is a hey, big party, man. Yeah, I can dig it. Stop right on. Hey, man, what's your name? Mother, mother, there's too many of you to cry. Brother, 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 there's far too many of you die.